Good morning and welcome to the thousands of students joining us today for the Macbeth live lesson. My name is Robin and I'm from RSC Education. We've had to make a change in today's lesson as planned and what you're about to see was filmed before the current lockdown was in place. Originally broadcast in 2018, this lesson was designed to support our recent production with Christopher Eccleston as Macbeth and Neve Cusack as Lady Macbeth. The lesson today is going to focus on the character of Lady Macbeth and you'll see Neve Cusack work with assistant director Peter Bradley on two particular scenes. Also, we have Neve, as well as some other actors from the RSC, ready on standby to answer your questions on Twitter. So if you have any questions, do tweet them to us using the hashtag RSC Macbeth. Make sure you tweet us before 12 o'clock and throughout the afternoon, we will be tweeting out our replies from those actors, again, using the hashtag RSC Macbeth. So make sure you keep checking back. It's time now for the lesson. So I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the Royal Shakespeare Company's live lesson, which we are streaming to you live from our studio here in Ravensbourne University, London. We're really excited because we've got over 38,000 students joining us this morning from all over the country to discover more about one of Shakespeare's most famous plays, Macbeth. So a big hello to you in Walton High to you in Lord Derby Academy, and also to you at St James's School, and a welcome to everybody who's watching. This morning, we're gonna focus on one character in particular, that of Lady Macbeth. And during today's lesson, we're gonna look at two of her soliloquies from the play. To help us do that, we've got Neve Cusack, who plays Lady Macbeth in the current production at the RSC, and joining Neve is Peter Bradley, the assistant director. And what we're going to see from Peter and Neve is how a director and an actor work together on a speech to find different ways it can be interpreted and how it can be brought to life for an audience. Now, I'm also joined in the studio by some Year 9 students from Uxbridge High School who will be working with us as we get to grips with this play. Morning, everybody. Morning. Neil, I'm going to come to you first. Now, I know you've been thinking about the play a little bit. Can you, in three words, describe Lady Macbeth. What's she like? Well, I think she's evil, intelligent and manipulative. Evil, intelligent and manipulative. There's no hanging about there. You've got that pretty clear. And Maya, how about you? What three words would you use? Um, demanding, controlling and fiery. Demanding, controlling and fiery. So we can already see that we've got two very different responses to the character. And we would love to know what you in your classrooms think as well. So you can tweet us using the hashtag RSC Macbeth. And please don't forget, use the form on the website to send in your questions for our Q&A with Neve and Peter, which will take place at the end of the lesson. Great, so let's get started. Don't forget, have your pens and paper standing by for later on. Good morning, both. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much for joining us. Neve, I'm going to come to you first. You've heard what these students had to say about Lady Macbeth. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us what you think? What's she like? Can you describe her at the beginning of the play? Well, the first thing I have to say as an actor, uh, you use yourself. So although... Um, there is a character written, you pour who you are into the mould of that character. So I am playing Lady Macbeth this season. She is a woman in her 50s because it's me. She's Irish because it's me. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think she's evil. I think she's someone who has had a lot of grief in her life. 
she has definitely lost one child, born a child and lost it. And in our made up background, we think they've had a number of miscarriages and they're a very devoted couple. They love each other very much and they have been married quite a long time. So the plan A of their life, which was to have a happy family and lots of children, has gone wrong. And she's now my age, so she can't have any more children. She knows that. And suddenly, there's this opportunity. She's just had this letter where she suddenly realizes that there's an opportunity for a plan B, a different life, which is one that they've talked about before, which is that he would be king and she would be queen. He deserves, deserves it. He's the best soldier that they've ever had. He wins loads of battles. And when we meet her, she's waiting for him to come back from yet another battle. Great, thank you. So we're going to look at the speech where the audience first meet Lady Macbeth. But Peter, could you tell us a little bit about what's happened in the play so far? Yes, so there's been a war. Uh, Macbeth has been fighting on the side of King Duncan. Um, there's been a battle that Macbeth has been brilliant at. He's killed loads of people and on, he's on his way back uh, from the battle when he's visited by three witches who have a series of premonitions for him, uh, with the most important being that he's going to become king. Um, so Macbeth writes all of this down in a letter and sends it to Lady Macbeth. And in the speech that we're just about to do, we've just, we just pick up with Lady Macbeth after she's read the letter. Fantastic. Well, let's go straight into that. And it'd be great to see how you two work together to start to unpick some of Shakespeare's language. Thank you very much. Brilliant. OK, so Neve, I think we should just dive straight in okay. and, and have a read and go from there. See how we go. Great. Glams thou art, and Cawdor, and shall be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly that wouldst thou holily, wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Thou'dst have great glands, that which cries, thus thou must do, if thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do, then wishest should be undone. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned with all. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's amazing. That's really good. Um, so what's the struggle that's going on in, in, that, in that speech, do you think? Well, Lady Macbeth knows her husband very well. They've been married for a long time and I think she knows that on the one hand, he is a very decent man. He's full of the milk of human kindness. Um, on the other hand, he is not without ambition. He would be great, you know, and they both know that he should really be king. So on the one hand, there's the decent man. And on the other hand, there is the need for him to have edge, to be prepared to do a terrible thing, kill another yeah, human brilliant. being in order to get something that they both feel he deserves. Great, that's, that's perfect. So mm -hmm. I suppose what we could do now is, um, could we have two students please to help us with yeah, this next exercise? Of course, uh, Heba and Anthony, why don't you step up and help Neve and, and Peter? Hello guys, um, so if you'd like to just take your position, uh, Heba, if you could just go here and Anthony, if uh, you could stand on this side of Neve. Um, so we were just talking about, uh, on the one hand, Macbeth is a decent man. He's 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 got he's you know he's a noble soldier, uh, and on the other hand, he's got this ambition uh, that but doesn't quite have the edge to to kind of follow through with it. So there's kind of decency, ambition, edge. So I wonder if uh, Anthony, if you can take on the role of representing decency, no acting involved. Don't worry. It's, it's just if you <laughs> if you if you're here, and Heber, if you uh, take on the role of representing ambition and edge, um, okay. then Neve, if, if the task for you is mm -hmm. to, to use Heather and Anthony mm -hmm. um, to, to help you explore the argument that's in, that's in the speech, mm -hmm. um, just to try and track through using both of them. Is, okay. that, is that clear? Yeah. Brilliant. Cool. Okay. Shall we have a go? Yes. Yeah. Nice. 
glams thou art, and Cordor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily, wouldst not play false. And yet, wouldst wrongly win. Thou'dst have great glams, that which cries, thus thou must do, if thou have it. And that which rather thou dost fear to do, then wishes should be undone. Hide thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned with all. Brilliant, perfect. Thank you, guys. Uh, you can go and sit back down on your, your seats now. <laughs> That's excellent. Brilliant, thank you, Neve. Um, yeah. So how do exercises like that help you in the rehearsal room? Well, um, when we start on a play and when you first read it, especially if it's Shakespearean language, some of it you don't understand. Some of it seems so um, extraordinary and grand and a wee bit intimidating that you need to sort of break it up into, mm. into, into bits. And the great thing about an exercise like that is you can see that this character is weighing up two ideas. She's trying to see, she's, you know, she's trying to solve how to get her husband to do the thing that they both want him to do. Um, so by, by dividing it up into sort of two, the two sides of the argument, it just, it just makes it simpler and clearer. And it's good for us to watch it visually to, yes, to, to yes. see you physically going through it. Yes, it? Yeah. And, it, and it's interesting because for me, sometimes I go a wee bit too fast when I'm actually doing the play. And what was great about that, I suddenly thought, oh, no, she has to take her time to go back to, you know, the ambitious thoughts that she has. And then, oh, gosh, that ambitious thought is also something that will give them something what they believe to be good and, and you know, in a way, decent, worthy of him. Do you know what I mean? So you, you're constantly, in, in that language, there is the possibility of a lot of things, but by taking two very definite um, sort of angles to go between, you really start, it starts to become simpler and you start to realise that actually Shakespeare's done an awfully good job <laughs> at, at giving you a, a really interesting argument, one that in a way we all kind of understand. Brilliant, thank you. So I want to ask Heber and Anthony, being part of that activity, seeing Neve go between the two sides of the argument, which side do you think won out in the end? I think the uh, edgy side won because it was more persuasive than the decent side. Great, yeah. great, fantastic. And Anthony, how about you? I think definitely edgy and ambitious because she was happier and more excited to talk about ambitious than she was about decency. Yeah. Very good indeed. Well, that's what we think here in the studio. We want to know what you think in your classrooms. Ultimately, the director and the actor are working together to make specific choices about how the words on the page can be interpreted and how that will bring the characters to life in a production. But let's move on to the next bit. Peter, before we go to the next speech, can you tell us what's happened in between in yes. the play? So immediately after that speech that we've just done, um, a servant enters the room and announces that the king is coming to their house tonight. Um, the king that they, she's just been alluding to in the previous speech that she wants Macbeth to kill. Yeah. Um, so the servant leaves and Lady Macbeth starts to talk to some spirits. Wow, Neve, why does she talk to the spirits? What's she trying to do? Well, I think with, um, 
she's just had this letter where her husband said these spirits appeared before him on the heath. And suddenly I think the notion of there being spirits who can be anywhere at any time mm. or at many times is there in the room. And I think she also, she knows that what she's hoping for and willing herself and her husband to do is wrong. I think the Macbeths are not without consciences. You know, I think they know that it is a terrible deed that they're about to perform. But she wants that strength. Life has been so hard for her. She has had such grief in her life by losing those children, at least one, um, that I think she just feels this is my only chance. I, I, I had one opportunity. That's gone. Fate has taken that away from me. But fate is giving me this opportunity. So I'm going to, if there are spirits, if there are spirits, I'm going to will them to come and, and give me the strength and actually banish all these sort of female uh, motherly instincts I have. Great, thank you. So that's really clear about where we're going to pick up from the next speech. We're going to look at this second speech now and start to unpick some of the language in that speech, but also think about the different interpretations that can be made when performing it. So this is your moment in your classrooms. Grab your pens or pencils, get them ready, and a piece of paper, because you're going to need them for this next activity. Great. Okay. So before we jump in with a, with a read-through of the speech, I think, Neve, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask you guys and, and everyone in their classrooms and at home, um, so if you guys just highlight any words that you think uh, stick out to you from Neve's, Neve's piece, and if anyone at home writes down anything that they hear that just kind of strikes them when Neve, when Neve uh, does the speech, uh, then we'll pick up with it later and see, see what happens. Great. Great. Perfect. Okay. Can we jump in? Thanks. Yep. The raven himself is hoarse. The croaks, the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits, that tend on mortal thoughts. Unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief, come thick night and pour thee in the dunnest smoke of hell. Let my keen knife see not the wound it makes. Nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry hold, hold. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Neve. That's great. Great. I want to know what some of the words were that you guys picked out. Renee, let's come to you first. Um, what word did you give us one? Um, compunctious. And this stand out to me because it comes with the words that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose. Great. Compunctious visitings of nature. Neve, what does that mean? Well, I think it means the, um, uh, the very thing that she, you know, the, the very thing that makes her uh, a woman, uh, all the things that would normally make her nurture and uh, be gentle towards and kind towards. She wants to get rid of all that side of her nature, all the obvious bits of her nature that should that that would stop her doing what she what she plans to do. Great. And Nabil, what what word did you give us? A word that stood out for you? Um, I highlighted a phrase: um, the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. Very good. Yeah, what's that about the blanket of the dark? Well, I, I love that too, actually, because um, I, I think it's, it's the notion that heaven, which is a kind of pure, glowing, uh, golden thing, you know, you imagine angels, 
Heaven can't get through this blanket of the dark, which, which is, she's asked night to come because she wants there to be no brightness. She knows that what she's about to do is a dark act. So she wants it to be dark so that heaven can't peep through and say, stop, stop what you're doing. Do you see what I mean? I think it's really, I love that bit as well because I just think she knows that she's doing a wrong thing, you know? It's, with a blanket, it's kind of like, it yes. envelops you, doesn't it? Yes. It's like, so you're kind of making everything around you kind of turn black. dark, black, yeah. yeah. Amazing. So that's really useful, I think, because I think we could start to think about that relationship that you have with those spirits, with mm -hmm. that darkness, mm -hmm. um, and see how that might change the performance. If, if, so, for example, why don't we try it com two completely different ways? So okay. the first way, um, let's think about if Lady Macbeth's relationship to the spirits was one that was really comfortable with those spirits, really kind of uh, welcoming them in and, yeah. and feel almost as if she might have, you know, had a chat with them before. Yeah, 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 great, <laughs> um, OK. Should we try that first? Yeah, yeah. Ace, yeah. Okay. cool. Whenever Shall I go from the very beginning of the speech? Yeah, yeah. let's go okay. from the beginning, yeah, okay. brilliant. The raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits, that tend on mortal thoughts. Unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief, come thick night and pour thee in the dunnest smoke of hell that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. Braille. Yeah, that was great. That was lovely, Neve. It's, it gives it a real different quality, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And the words that we spoke about as well, they kind of, it, it's interesting to see how they change yeah. depending on, on what you said, like how your relationship to those spirits are, yeah. is. Um, brilliant. Uh, well, how, how did you feel about that? What was, was that? Well, I thought I thought um, I think I think it's an I think it's a really interesting angle um, because there is even to say uh, uh, that last line, um, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark. There's a wit in there mm. to cry, hold, hold, because she's kind of jeering at heaven. Yeah. You know, she's saying, I dare you, which is a, you know, it's such a bold thing to do. I mean, I'm quite a superstitious person and I, you know, I think to say to heaven, yeah, we're going to put a blanket across you and you can't say hold is, is, is quite kind of forceful. It's huge. Just, yeah. to, just to be that bold to just even, you know, I don't care that say. I'm saying something yeah, yeah, sacrilegious. Yeah. So I think that was, you know, by thinking of, of, evil and the evil spirits as sort of friends of hers, mm. mates of hers, in a way that gives her a boldness. And I think that makes her more evil, actually, <laughs> yeah. because yeah. she's kind of, in a way, she's not, she doesn't care. She doesn't care what she's doing mm. in that version because she's kind of having fun. Mm. It trivialises it, doesn't it? It makes the, the murder of Duncan feel like it's something that's a game, yes. in a way. Yeah. which I think to be honest, I think in the end, you realise through the play that th th they're not evil people. If they were evil people, it would have been easy. They would have done it, they would have forgotten about it. But actually, they, partly because of what happens, you know, and the other murders that they have to commit, but I think it's also that they know, they know they're doing something wrong. Mm. So should, should we try it slightly differently now yeah. then? Um, so what about if that relationship to those spirits, rather yeah. than being kind of one where they are your mates? Yeah that actually you're terrified of them, that, that, that this is, like we said before, it's a hugely bold thing to do, to yeah. just step into that room and, and, and say, hello spirits, yes, <laughs> and yes, talk yeah, to them. Yeah. Just kind of crazy and bold. So yeah. let's, let's see if that relationship is one of, they're dangerous, those spirits. They, they, okay. You don't know what they're gonna do, they're not your friends. Okay, we try that? Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Neve. The raven himself is hoarse, 
that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief, come thick night and pour thee in the dunnest smoke of hell that my keen knife see not the wound it makes nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry hold, hold. Great, yeah, brilliant. That was amazing. So when you got down on your knees yeah. then, it felt like you were pleading with them rather yeah. than, yeah, rather than kind of drawing them in. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting. So that, do we think that that's changed our, our opinions of, of Lady Macbeth there? <laughs> we, I don't know. Well, I think, I think, there she, she knows, if you do it that extremely, I mean, we've taken two quite extreme yeah, yeah. Uh, angles on her. But, uh, and I think there's a mixture, you know, there's bits that really fit that and bits that really, really don't. Mm. But I think, um, I think what it gives you is just what a huge thing she's asking. She's asking for everything evil to come and sort of fill her up from, she says, from the crown to the toes, so from the top of her head, all of her. She just wants it to be filled with evil, which is what she knows is required to kill someone, you know, for that moment. I'm not saying she's an evil person all the time. And I think the fact that she identifies that it's an evil, that she needs that amount of evil in order to do something as terrible as that, that means she knows it's wrong and in a way that means she has an understanding of what's right and that maybe she feels bad about it, but she's going to go and do it anyway. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back here now to Rene. Now you saw Neve do that speech two really different ways. Which one really stood out for you if you had to pick one over the other? I think the version where she's welcoming the spirits because she knows that she's doing something wrong and with her natural personality she knows that she can't do it because that's why she's asking for help from hell and all the supernatural stuff like that. Great, really interesting, thank you. And Nabil, you, what, um, which one did you prefer? Um, I, I liked the one when she was more afraid of the spirits. I liked it because... Um, it, it, it kind of like contr contrasts with her, her relationship to Macbeth, because um, normally Macbeth would be the one following her orders and kind of like quivering at every, everything she was saying. But in this scene, um, the roles were sort of reversed and you could, you could see how she, um, how, how we would see um, Macbeth um, and Lady Macbeth. So in this scene, she's, she's the weaker one and and the spirits could sort of me be like Macbeth. Oh, great. Wow, really interesting there. So what's fascinating is seeing Neve change the attitudes or the intentions of Lady Macbeth changes the way that she speaks the text. And of course, that changes the way that we, the audience, feel about the character. There's certainly loads of imagery in that speech, and it's really useful to see how actors and directors uh, might unpack that language. Now, Neil, I'm going to come back to you. So at the beginning of our lesson today, I asked you how would you describe Lady Macbeth. You've seen Neve do some brilliant speeches there. 
Um, tell us now, have your thoughts changed? Yeah, although she has a bad side of her, she also has a good side, and it's like they're versing each other. Great, so the two sides are competing of herself. Yeah. yeah, really interesting. And Maya, what about you? I think it shows her soft side coming out and that she really loves Macbeth so much that she would really consider killing someone. Great, fantastic, thank you very much. So that is where we're going to pause our work on the text. And now it's the moment where you in your classrooms can get involved. We've got loads of questions that have been coming in from all around the country and I'm going to put them to Neve and Peter right now. Thank you very <laughs> much indeed. So I've got their questions here. So the first one comes from Ben in South Shore Academy who says, do you think that Macbeth would have killed Duncan without the influence of Lady Macbeth? I think that's a great question. I think it's really I've good. Well say. done, Ben, yeah. Um, uh, and my short answer is no. I don't <laughs> think he would. I don't think he would have done it. There's a, a wee bit later on, which we haven't covered, but in the play, where actually he says, we're not going to do it. Uh, you know, we'll go no further in this business. And... Um, he actually, his conscience is, is sort of awakened quicker than hers. So I think, I think her determination is what pushes him into the very first murder. And then I think what happens after that, she doesn't really think of all the consequences, but he's suddenly um, catapulted into um, a kind of trail of murders that he has to, has to commit. Um, but I think it's her that forces the yeah, first yeah, thing to happen. That. And like yeah. you were talking about before, uh, this, this plan A and plan B that mm. they have, that, mm. that he does it. And he could, you could argue that he does kill Duncan to try and get a better life with Lady Macbeth. Yes. So if, if she wasn't there, then what would that life be? <laughs> well, I yeah. think that's very much how we play it in yeah. our production. Mm. And I hope when you watch it that you'll see that, that definitely he loves her deeply. And her grief over losing the child that we know they've lost, that's talked about by Macduff. Macduff says they, he has no children. And she says a little bit later, I have given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. So there was a child and we can deduce because of what Macduff says later that there, there, there's no children now. And it's from that that me and, me and Chris and Polly, the director and Peter, um, that was where we started from. They, they have lost at least one child and 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 he wants yes he wants to give her an alternative life that is fulfilling great thank you very much so our second question comes from eve from cottingham high school and eve says to what extent is lady macbeth's ruthless ambition to blame for her manipulation or is there something more supernatural at play well I, I think, in a way, uh, part of what I said before is, 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 is what would inform my answer there. I think she, she does have a ruthless ambition. I do, I do, and I, but I think that comes from pain. I don't think that she is a witch herself, if that's what you're getting at. Mm. Um, I think that she, the possibility of there being supernatural aid available to her she's certainly open to but i don't think she i think it's actually the letter that macbeth sends her that makes her aware of there being something supernatural in the air i don't think um she necessarily has had a dialogue with the supernatural before or that she herself yeah, yeah. is a sort of witchy uh kind of yeah. magician kind of person. I don't think she is that. But it, there is a world, the world is a world where the supernatural is something that is part of people's language in a way that maybe we now don't think of it as, as being there so much. Yes. And it would have been part of Shakespeare's world too, wouldn't it? Yes. The supernatural, that was very much in his mind, am I right, Peter, in yeah. terms of when he was writing the play? Yeah, and I think as well, Lady Macbeth, you, you never actually see anything that, that's supernatural in the play, that's do you? That's absolutely you, you, true. That, that Banquo and Macbeth both see... Yeah, and, and there are ghosts that appear in the play yes, that, that and Macbeth sees, sees yes, and you yes. don't, you yes, actually I don't, don't see them. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Um, so yeah. it, it, it could be argued that, you know, that however, wh whether, whatever drives Lady Macbeth to, you know, her end point in the yeah. play, 
is not supernatural. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's good. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So our next question, um, this is from Jamal from Brainsworth Academy. Really interesting one here. What does Lady Macbeth think is the difference between greed and ambition? Oh, well, that's a really good question. <laughs> mm. um, uh, I think she thinks ambition is a good thing. And I think it's interesting that a lot of people think of ambition as not a good thing, but actually it is a good thing. We all need a little bit of ambition. We all want to get better at something we really love doing or we want to get a job that we, you know, that is, 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 is going to enable us to follow a path, a career path that we, we really want. So that's good. Ambition is good. I think greed is when you want more than, than, than anybody else or, and, and maybe that you want more than you is your due. And, and I suppose that you're prepared. Greed is to do with being prepared to put other people out of the way. I mean, it's very extreme in, in the Macbeth's case because they're prepared to kill someone. Mm or people. But I think, um, you know, greed is, is not so, not such a positive thing. Great, thank you. Next, I like this one. This is really specific. Olivia from South Shore Academy wants to know, when Lady Macbeth says to put the matter in her dispatch, yes. does she mean to kill Duncan? That's a really good question. It's one we had, mm, didn't yeah, we? Yeah. Because I think at the very beginning, she does, she thinks we'll do it together. Mm, and she okay. talks about doing it together. And also organizing the whole thing is going to be her, her you know, she's going to organize the banquet. She's also going to, you know, she t says later on that she's going to drug the, the bodyguards right. so that they fall asleep. But I think at the beginning, he imagines that they're going to be in the room together. And, and I mean, she talks about um, my knife in that speech we've just done, you know, mm -hmm. that, my keen, that my keen knife, see not the wound it makes. But then a little bit later, the actual reality, the notion that this is a very human being who's lying asleep in front of her and indeed reminds her of her own father, that's why she says she couldn't do it. She has never killed anybody in her life. We know that Macbeth is a soldier. He's a professional soldier. So he has killed people. Yeah. She hasn't. So I think she kind of thinks, well, she changes, the, she moves the goalposts. I think at the beginning, she's saying, yep, we're going to do mm. it together. I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to sort out the banquet. I'm going to get drug the, the bodyguards. And then together we will kill Duncan. And I think as the evening wears on, she goes, OK, I'll do the drugging. I've done that bit. <laughs> and now you, the man, you know, yeah. you go and do the, 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 the soldiery kidding. bit. And that has kind of pretty bad consequences for the murder because he comes out and he's kind of covered in blood yes. and he's, he's got the knives with him and that wasn't the plan. Yes, and yes, So it yes. all goes slightly wrong yes. because you, you, you kind of go off script a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he goes majorly off script, yes. <laughs> I think. Um, but of course, she before that has gone off script. Mm. And I think also, I think an interesting thing, and this isn't for me to really say, but I think the whole thing is Macbeth has never killed someone he loves or has liked. You know, he's a soldier. He's done it in combat yeah. when he's been in battle. But he's not, you know, he's not done a premeditated murder of, a, of, a, of someone that was his friend. Right. And do you think Lady Macbeth is surprised then when he's not able to... Completely, I think. I, I think she hasn't thought. She has never imagined that he would be such a mess when he came out, and she's trying to sort of. She gets quite cross with him, or at least I do in in our production. <laughs> and um, and she thinks, you know, come on, buck up. You're supposed to be a man, you know. She uses that a lot, actually. She does say. Um, she, she she sort of chides him for not being manly enough a number of times in the play, um, and clearly it's something that she knows. As many married couples do, they know the button that's going to press, that's going to make someone do something. The longer you know someone, you know, the easier it is to know what's going to make them do what you need them to do. Great, thank you. Uh, this is one for you, Peter. This is uh, Rhys and Brandon from Uxbridge High School. Um, they want to know, Peter, what, as your role as assistant director, you get to see the whole mm -hmm. uh, piece and, and look at it with, with Polly Finley, the director. What's, do you have a favourite role in the play? 
Oh, wow. I couldn't possibly tell you that. <laughs> I, I think he's on the spot now. I think if you asked Paulie the same question, she, could, she would also say, I, you know, they're all, it's all, what the joy of being a director is, is, is building an ensemble, a company of, of actors, and, and without any of those characters in the play, and without any of the actors in, in, in the company, the, the, whole, the whole show is a different show, and, it, and it's not the one that we want to make. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not even going to answer, just because I, I think <laughs> the joy of it, the, the joy of it is, is, the, is building a series of different relationships between people that, that result in this kind of high yeah. drama that Shakespeare's written. Yeah. <laughs> sorry to cop out. That's all right, <laughs> Reese and Brandon. Yeah. Sorry, we haven't got an answer for you today, but we want to know what your favourite role is. Okay. Um, we've got this next one from uh, Kyan. I hope that's how you pronounce your name. From Keister Yarborough Academy, who wants to know uh, who inspires you both? Who who inspires you? Other actors or? Uh, well, I've got to say, um, and and this sounds like I've been told to say this, and I really, really haven't. But Shakespeare inspires me because I think. I think the reason I, I wanted to do this was because I feel that how we feel about being in love or being jealous of somebody or wanting a job or a position is, it, that someone else has, sometimes it can feel really big, really, really big. And I think actually a lot of modern language and a lot of the way we speak now and the way we use text now, they make the language smaller and shorter and, and sometimes not, it doesn't really express how big those feelings can be, how big it can be to fall in love, how big it can be to really feel jealous of someone or hate someone or feel great pain and grief. And we've got this poet called Shakespeare who lived all those hundreds of years ago, but his language is still just about modern enough for him to give us the tools to express how big it is to be a human being. And it is. It is. And we mustn't pretend it's not. Mm. And I think that's one of the reasons I want to continue doing Shakespeare. And I want to talk to people like you who are, who are encountering Shakespeare for the first time. He's giving you language that reminds you that it is epic to be alive. Great. Peter? Oh, this is going to sound like I'd plan this as well. <laughs> but, um, but working with actors like you, Neve, is, oh. is what inspires me. Is working with, because what, what you do is, is amazing because you bring to life the words of, that, that Shakespeare's written. Yeah. Um, but what's great about you is that, is that you're so generous and open um, to different possibilities, like we were doing in, in that workshop then. Yeah. And the, the idea that you could explore something in, in you know, hundreds of different ways yeah. is what inspires me as a director, because there's, it means that you, know, you can never stop working, you can never stop creating new performances of these plays. And I think, I think the other thing that we both feel and, and have felt through the rehearsal is, in a way, you have to sometimes take wrong turnings mm. in order to find where the right one might be. So it's, there is nothing that you can say in a classroom that will be wrong full stop. It may be a wrong turning that will actually make you suddenly think, oh, no, that doesn't quite work. That's how we work in rehearsal. No, that, that isn't going to work. It just doesn't feel right. And you have, what you guys are going to start learning to do is to follow your instincts, to say, you know, would my mother do that? If my mother was Mrs. Macbeth, would she do that? Why would she do that? Why would my dad do that? Why would I do that? And, it's, it's, and, and sometimes you take wrong turnings and that's fine. Mm -hmm. because, and that's the great thing about rehearsal. And if you have a really happy company, as we do, and if you have really supportive people like Peter and po Polly in the room saying, yeah, OK, give it a go. Try, it, try doing it that way. And yes, you may feel you've got omelette all over your face. <laughs> But actually, you will get something from it if you're brave enough. Great, thank you. I think we've got time for just one more question. So it's going to come from Ruth from Oswestry School. And she says, do you think Shakespeare might have been an early supporter of people with mental health issues and specifically postnatal depression? I know, Neve, you were talking about the fact that Lady yeah, yeah. Macbeth has lost, <coughs> lost children or... Yeah. Well... But, you know, Peter, you answer. Yeah, I think it's it's fascinating that that strand of the play, isn't it? Mm. In that the the way that the language that people might use, you know, in in that time might be that she's gone mad or mm. she's hysterical or things like that, and and that's a like it's really difficult to work out. You know, it, is it madness in in the play at least? Is it is it 
what, what we think of as madness, or is it, you know, mental health, which is which is different? It, it, yeah. You know, there are there's specific kind of uh, it's it's a disease. It's a, it's a human physical thing. Um, whereas madness, the idea of labelling it as madness makes it sound like it's kind of just unexplainable. Um, a bit like you know the supernatural. Is it you know? It, we spoke about that before. Is it the mm. you know the supernatural that Correct. drives her to do what she does? But mm. I don't. I don't think so. I, th I think that yeah. It's a really. He's got such a brilliant sense of what mental health and, and how people behave. Yes, and yeah. I mean one thing that we learned was that Shakespeare himself lost a son. So he knows what grief is like and I think that people in extreme situations do extreme things and and so mental health is is in a way um, a much less sort of general uh, uh, and 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 uh, 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 negative thing than saying someone's mad you sort of dismiss people when they when you say they're mad whereas actually mental health is something that we're all negotiating through uh, throughout our lives and things can be thrown at us or we can do things that we wish we hadn't that put us in a different place and i think that's what shakespeare is exploring mm. here yeah great thank you well that's all we've got time for all the questions we've got time for thank you very much and that's it from us here in the studio and now it's over to you We've met Lady Macbeth and explored a little bit about what drives her and the different choices that you can make. Your challenge now is take a look at Act 1, Scene 7. At the beginning of that scene, Macbeth has made the decision that he will not kill King Duncan in order to gain the crown. Then Lady Macbeth comes in and she persuades her husband to murder him. So in pairs, pair up, read that scene aloud and have a think about the different tactics Lady Macbeth uses in order to convince Macbeth. How forceful are her arguments? And how easily is Macbeth convinced? Well, that's almost all we've got time for today, I'm afraid. Thank you so much to Peter and Neve for joining us and working so generously and honestly with us this morning. It's been really fascinating to get a glimpse of how professional actors and directors work on the text. And thanks too to the Uxbridge High School students who have been with us today as well. Before we go, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our new Shakespeare Learning Zone for students that's coming soon to the RSC website. It's got everything you want to know about Shakespeare's plays, his characters, his languages, all in one place. And you can check it out very soon from April the 26th. If you want help with your homework or just want to know a little bit more about these genius plays, it's definitely worth a look. We hope you very much enjoyed today's live lesson and we hope that you'll be back with us next Thursday at 9am when we present the RSC School's broadcast of Macbeth. We look forward to seeing you then. Don't forget to look out for your school's names in the credits which are coming up now. Thanks very much. Bye.
We hope you enjoyed watching Neve and Peter working this morning, giving you an insight into how we work at the RSC on a play. Don't forget to check the hashtag RSC Macbeth to see the actors' responses to the questions that you have been tweeting in. There are follow-up resources available on the live lesson page of the RSC website. The address is on your screen now. Thank you so much for joining us this morning.